Hey folks, Joseph Ace Bora here. Yes, what else? Continuing with those commercial breaks on this hot summer. I, I can't do anything about it though. But I, at times like this, I don't always have time to do any reviews. But I hope I get to do one this time. Um, so enough with that. I'm going to review another film that stars Kelly Preston. I mean, now that she passed away. And it was a movie I saw a long time ago, but I really enjoy it and love it. Uh, it came out on February 8th, 1985. Didn't do quite as well at the box office. Only made over $8 million, I believe. Like, over. Uh, out of a small budget, but they did the best they could. Um, it's a 50s-style teen comedy called Mischief. It's a story about um, a young, shy teenage boy who wants to fall in love with this beautiful, sexy bombshell. But in order to get to that, uh, he meets this young rebel from uh, another town. He just moved to Nelsonville, Ohio, which he lives, which basically they both have a relationship together and hoping there's a chance to actually play some mischief by finding a way to to show all these moves and everything so he can get to this girl that he really loves. But he's having trouble with that. And also because the rebel wanted to fall in love with this beautiful girl that accidentally met from this uh, wealthy class bully that's yeah, they got to stand up against too. Yeah. This was at the time when uh, Fox was actually putting out, or it's this way, any other studio. I mean, they were coming up with um, a 50 style uh, teen comedies in the 80s, which at that point on, they were going for ones that, are, that had a lot of sex, you know, some nudity, and, and also throwing in some foul and vulgar language with some violence in there. Uh, this was that particular trend. I mean, ever since um, the success of Porky's. But I would say that considering how overrated that film was, I mean, that this was a Canada film with that subject matter directed by Bob Clark. Um, I would say it's one of the better films to come out uh, during the 80s. Yeah, because I, I know people go rush by, you know, having to spend, like, a small amount of money so they get to see all these movies, you know, on screen. You know, when the parents aren't around. That sort of thing. Okay. But this is a film, um, which I would say it's overlooked. Um, I think everyone should give this film a try. Uh, but it did have some familiar stars, um, besides Kelly Preston. Uh, Doug McKeon, who I believe started out in a movie called On Golden Pond, among a few others. And apparently this was his uh, starting point, um, because he's the lead of the film. And actually, he actually had fun working on the film, too, uh, with the production value, having to be shot in in this beautiful town in Ohio. I mean, he, he really had a... He, he, he recall the, the fun times he had, you know, having to work with this great cast and all. Because he was only 18 at the time, and at that point on, he was already becoming an adult, so he would be more mature for this age. So that means he'll get to be as comfortable as possible to do those risque scenes and all. So they didn't have a guardian to actually uh, you know, help him out. And he, and he loves um, the atmosphere of the film being set in the 50s. He loves to drive old cars and listen to the era of music, of course. Yeah, we're going to get to that too. And, and all this and all this classy clothes, you name it, it's like the particular innocent uh, period. 
but maybe not too innocent. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, you also got uh, Catherine Mary Stewart to join in, too, who was previously in films like uh, Night of the Comet and The Last Starfighter. She was great in this. And, and D.W. Brown, he later went on to own a studio in Santa Monica, California. Went on to do several TV shows and movies. So he's, he's great. Uh, I don't know what happened to Chris Nash, though, but I think he went on to do something or any other. Uh, Jamie Gertz, yep, if you're familiar with her, she went on to do films like Crossroads, yeah, the one with Ralph Macchio from 1986. But she also did Less Than Zero with Anthony McCarthy and Robert Downey Jr. Uh, Renegades with uh, Kiefer Sullivan and Lou Diamond Phillips. A Twister with Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt. Yeah. I sh and I know she's been in like several TV shows and movies that I could think of. Uh, she was actually in the, the TV show that uh, one of my friends at Inclusion Films had worked on, uh, well, actually appeared on, and but also helped out uh, with the crew. Uh, there was, it was a short-lived series called The Neighbors. Um, if you haven't seen that show, it's... Well, I, let's just say it's, it's sort of like Meet the Applegates, but in a whole different story. <laughs> but for TV. Okay. And, um, of course, you also got Terry O'Quinn, um, who I know went on to do the film The Stepfather, along with the sequel. And then he also went on to films like The Cutting Edge. He was in Blind Fury, several other films in his career. But also he was in the TV show Lost. Yeah. So, either way, I mean, this is... Um, Quite something for this uh, particular small film. Um, anyway, let's get to the review. It starts once again, because <laughs> I always keep doing this. Uh, Doug McKeon, Chris Nash, Catherine Mary Stewart, Kelly Preston, D.W. Brown, Jamie Gertz, Margaret Bright, Graham Jarvis, and Terry O'Quinn. It's written by Noel Black and it's directed by Mel Damsky. The movie begins, which actually had this clever blurb from Star Wars, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, in Ohio in 1956, yeah, Nelsonville. Yeah, Fox was being pretty clever, considering that this was a studio that produced and released the Star Wars movies, well, until Lucas um, became part of it, and I know Disney now owns the rights to them. Well, you get the idea. <laughs> way back um, we meet a young but very shy and clumsy teenager named Jonathan Bella who's played by Doug McKeon who does what he where he does his mischievous ways by actually trying to impress this beautiful sexy blonde named Marilyn McCauley who's played by Kelly Preston but in order for him to do so we meet this new kid in town who just moved in with his father, Claude, who's played by Terry O'Quinn, whose name is Gene Harborough, who's played by Chris Nash, who's just running around in his motorcycle through the moving truck until he got run over by this wealthy class bully who's a, a jealous jock and an asshole named Kenny. Is played by D.W. Brown, but right next to him is his uh, beautiful girlfriend named Bunny Miller, who's played by Catherine Mary Stewart. And that's when um, they were both shocked to find out that if he's alright, I mean, he fell off, run over by his bike, and, and Bunny actually helped him out, and that's when they two meet eye to eye, you know, blushing completely. So now he was getting ready to fall in love with Bunny, but Kenny, however, refused to help. He's going to end up uh, 
giving him a black eye. Anyway, Jonathan finally met uh, Gene uh, just when he came down the, from his room and actually uh, eventually joined in to help and give some advice, a lot of tips. Um, even though he had to give him um, a wrench or any other tools to fix his bike and also playing basketball and all that. Uh, but anyway, they begin to develop um, a very great relationship together, but hoping that they'll find a way to, with uh, Gene coaching Jonathan on how to attract women. So at that point on, a carnival's uh, about to arrive and hoping that, well, here's their answer. They had to go to this kissing booth, well, not exactly a particular booth, uh, where they had to pay like a dollar just so they'll be able to kiss uh, all these free girls. Yeah, which also includes uh, a nerdish girl named Rosalie Hewitt, who's played by Jamie Gertz. So, yeah, Jonathan ends up kissing her, which hoping he was going to kiss uh, Marilyn. Just when Gene was also hoping to kiss uh, Bunny, but at that point on, well, Gene kissed Marilyn. Jonathan kiss uh, Rosalie. So it was tough. So yes, um, they had to continue with the mischievous ways to find a way for Jonathan to win his affection with Marilyn and also have uh, Gene win his affection with Bunny. So at that point on, you know, they had to do a lot of tips like having Jonathan, you know, try to act cool and just lean before he ends up slipping, and then next thing you know, uh, another tip was having to ride on the bike before getting run over, which causes him to have a bleeding lip, and then he sh she shows up, he has a handkerchief, I mean, Marilyn just clean him, and then next thing you know, well, became sort of a pervert by actually touching her breasts. <laughs> okay. So I, at that point on, I mean, things were going almost as smooth as possible, but but they figured, you know, there is a way to actually fix this uh, relationship, was that Mar by the time they went to a, a local diner, you know, Rosalie, you know, who works over there, you know, accidentally, you know, gave um, and served uh, Jonathan the fries and burgers, you know, sloppily. Uh, Marilyn finally shows up and actually asks Jean on a date to go to the drive-in to see uh, Rebel Without a Cause because he saw it every time, two times. So this will be his third one. So he invited um, Jonathan along with Bunny to actually join in to see if this could work. But I know this was going to be a tough one because Jonathan's afraid that that Gene's going to end up falling in love with Marilyn, and Marilyn's not going to get into uh, Jonathan, and or at this rate, Bunny will end up with Jonathan. So, also try to make a promise. So at that point on, um, right in the middle of the movie, uh, they just went to get some refreshments until Kenny and his gang arrived and started being the crap out of Jonathan, but Gene came on and, and just decided to challenge um, Kenny for a race which is very similar to the Chicky run in Rebel Without a Cause which they're gonna play chicken somewhere in the factory yeah, in, in the middle of the road so yes um, they had to drive to Baker. Kenny has to drive his uh, convertible they had a collision they crashed um, but Kenny's, uh, you know, windshield got, uh, cracked uh, open and has a lot of scratches, but, uh, unfortunately, uh, Jonathan Studebaker, which is his father's, got some damage in there, too, so now they have to take it for repairs. But, uh, the car that, well, um, the Studebaker car that um, 
which at this rate Gene had borrowed from his father, uh, suddenly crashed and all scraped, and so it had to be taken. So it had to be told to fix it for repairs, and that's where you know Claude got so upset at, at Gene that he actually uh, punched him right in front of Bunny and the rest. So he got grounded. He hasn't shown up at school because of his um, being grounded at his own room. But Jonathan came by to his room and actually tried to fix things up uh, by actually riding on his uh, motorcycle, you know, just running around during cur curfew times, which I know they're going to get into bigger trouble <laughs> while they're drinking some alcohol beverage that he has. I know he was like listening to music and all this other sort of stuff, like, like the song "Ain't That a Shame" by Fats Domino. <laughs> okay. Um. So as as the time goes by, Jonathan finally gets to um, Maryland. They fell in love. Things were going so well. I mean, just when Gene actually tried to find a way to to find out about what that he was going to be able to be with Bunny and, and Marilyn was upset because well we know that uh, Gene was already going to break up with her that was just the whole plan and also have uh, Jonathan be able to have the guts to actually call uh, Marilyn and so that way they'll arrange a date and be able to hang around from now on and that's what they've been doing so both um, Jonathan and Jean are now hanging around with their girlfriends. You know, like for example, they were going horseback riding. Meanwhile, uh, John Finn and, and Marilyn were making love in a Studebaker, <laughs> which led to that moment too, where he's about to take off her panties and suddenly just <laughs> fell all the way down <laughs> while he was holding his her panties and. <laughs> Yeah, if you saw the movie poster, I think you'll you'll see what I mean. Um, but that was a very uh, clever scene. Um, oh, and I'm gonna mention this one scene alone. I had to do this because this is the moment that I think everyone's waiting for. If you think of the movie Fast Times at Richmond High, you know the scene, the the fantasy pool scene with Phoebe Cates. Uh, in a red bikini and she takes off uh, her top and gets to see her breasts well here's a scene that's <laughs> that's even better was when Marilyn finally asked uh, Jonathan out um, inside her room so they can have sex while the parents are away you know just going to a wedding well they're about to have sex um, she took off her clothes. He took off his clothes too. So we get to see full frontal nudity. You know, by taking the the panties and the bra off, you'll see her breasts, her vagina, you know, with a hair bush. And that's when they fell in love. But Marilyn was about to tell Jonathan if if he has protection on him, which is condom. But nope, he didn't because he didn't know. And they're just going around having sex. They were humping around, which <laughs> Marilyn's uh, head starts to <laughs> almost crack open to, yeah, just keep humping around, hurting her head onto the bed while her collie shows up, you know, smiling. Yeah, it looks like Lassie. And then those two birds are, like, watching. I mean, this was, like, so awkward. But I gotta say, it, it's probably the most sexiest and funniest scene ever that just turned people on and, and turn wild completely. I mean, I bet for those who rented this movie on VHS, they started rewinding back and forth, back and forth, just to get to that scene. <laughs> I mean, I guarantee you, though, the same way they did it with Fast Times. Um, but then the parents showed up, and that's when they're trying to find a way to hide Jonathan, get his clothes back on, and then he had to leave outside of the window through the roof and then he was already ready to get dressed but he's already like almost halfway there 
and then Marilyn's mother showed up and just basically watched Jonathan just when he was about to go down. So now, well, she's incredibly appalled. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very funny. Um, as days went on, though, of course, uh, Gene working at, at an old gas station, which is mobile, just going around, you know, helping out just just to make more money and hoping this will, will give him some time. Kenny and his buddies showed up, you know, just having him, you know, feel his gas, you know, fuel his gas and, and just, uh, wipe his windshields, you know, and then at that point on, he started teasing him right in front of Jonathan at a local diner, which creates a, a chaos fight, uh, a chaotic fight between Gene and and Kenny, which at this rate causes uh, Gene to get kicked out of the out of town, when the owner of, of the local diner just um, brought in the gun and and just call off the fight. Yeah, I mean, Gene actually just started uh, taking the milkshakes and started knocking them all the way around him and, and this game. So, so now um, Claude was so mad at him that. He wanted to kick him out, out of town. So now he's all alone. Everyone was very shocked about what happened, and Jonathan felt very disappointed. Same goes with Bunny. And and if that wasn't bad enough, I mean that's when Marilyn spread the bad news about since which was supposed to be good when Marilyn as he asked uh, Jonathan to go on to go for her for the senior prom because he was very happy that he got to do this, that and hoping that they'll make it up for after what happened it turns out that Marilyn wants to go out with a football jock and he wanted to, but he was hoping that she might be able to ask Jonathan if maybe if it's okay or not but unfortunately Jonathan got so mad that he called us all off, decided, I'm not going to bother going with you anymore. That's it. So he's all alone until Gene finally showed up um, at a local diner. So things were going pretty well, as it seems. I'm hoping that there's going to be something better for him to do. But then he had to go back to high school to, you know, for the prom. And just to see if Gene will be able to get to talk to Bunny, but Kenny came around to tell him to leave and and everyone else told him that you're not welcome here as a student because you're suspended. So of course Gene left along with Jonathan and just to explain to Gene that you know I, I'm just gonna move around I'm not gonna deal with girls anymore because I will never understand. While Gene on the other hand just wanted to hoping that he'll be able to go with Bunny on his own you know riding on his motorcycle so Jonathan just helped out have him together and then you know things are going quite as smooth as possible so now both uh, Gene and Bunny are going to be all alone while Jonathan will find a way to do something on his own by getting even with Kenny by going into that collision you know, driving a student baker and and crashing his his uh, convertible to Kenny, and it went straight into the fire hydrant. So, thank God for that. So now he's becoming pretty much like Gene. <laughs> but that's where um, Rosalie came by and and was amazed by <laughs> what just happened. You know, during this particular chase. So now, uh, Jonathan actually asked out for Rosalie, so things just seem perfect for him. <laughs> so, on his own, with, with, with an outcast. Um, so yeah, this is a very funny, um, very um, classy um, teen comedy that I'm sure everyone should watch, you know. And I, I would say it's better than most of the 
the actual teen comedies from that period, but this one really works, in my opinion. I mean, it got mixed reviews when it came out. People say that the plot was shallow. I mean, I know it had it had uh, foul language, vulgar humor, and lots of and some sex scenes here and there. But I thought it really worked in this particular level. I mean, the cast definitely played exactly how everyone had played in the in all these other '50s movies. But the cast themselves really worked. Uh, Doug McKeon definitely did an excellent job playing Jonathan. I mean, he was. He really loved his parts, as I mentioned already. I mean, he had a great time knowing that at, at that age, you know, he was. You know, that he, he can pretty much do anything as an adult than, than he was as a kid, a teenager. Um, Captain Mary Stewart was beautiful as Bunny. And I could definitely see the chemistry with uh, Chris Nash, who was just awesome as Gene. You know, the rebel himself who can do no wrong. Um, D.W. Brown plays an asshole of uh, Bunny's uh, Joe's boyfriend, Kenny, and does what he can to, to stop him until... Well, you know how that goes. Uh, of course, Kelly Preston, God rest her soul. I mean, she was deep down of it, the most sexiest uh, girl of the entire film. And very beautiful. I mean, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of girl that does make you want to go all the way. <laughs> I mean, with or without protection. Uh, there is a moment in the movie, too, where uh, when Jonathan accidentally crashed into the fire hydrant of, of the Studebaker, um, <laughs> she actually uh, goes all the way through the, the fire hydrant and just goes around dancing and, you know, you know washing her legs. You know, it, it was like, oh, man, that's, a, that's another sexy moment. Uh, Jamie Gertz, um, very, just basically a shy, nerdy uh, teenager as Rosalie, you know, does what she does, but at, at the end she did change her braces and, and her glasses, so now she's quite beautiful now than she was at that. Uh, there's one scene I had to mention too, was when Jonathan dropped his pencil uh, during class, you know, with Gene, Bunny, and all the rest, you know, while they were doing the reports or so. Um, he was about to pick it up, and then suddenly, well, he got a boner after he spotted uh, Marilyn's uh, upskirt, you know, panties, and <clears throat> was causing him to be completely nervous. The, the entire class started laughing at him, and he was afraid to get up, but because he told the teacher that his foot his leg went to sleep and his other leg went to sleep and then he's about to cover it up through his uh, books and he had to drop it and then that's where yeah we saw that he had a boner I mean that was just so fucked up <laughs> a lot of funny scenes a lot of great moments here and there I mean it's, it's a feel-good comedy um, nothing wrong with that I mean it may not be for kids though because of, of the language and all but it's it's a movie that I'm sure everyone during the, that period would remember by. It definitely has a uh, kick-ass uh, 50s soundtrack, so it definitely has the feel to it. Like it has uh, songs from Fats Domino, Little Richard, yeah, the, the pioneer of rock and roll, God rest his soul. Um, you got Elvis Presley, Buddy Holly, and many other songs to follow, and it really works, too. Because you can't have a, a 50s style movie without the soundtrack. I mean, otherwise it would just pretty much be dull at this point. Uh, Nelsonville, Ohio does look very beautiful too. It's a real town. Um, you can definitely see a, a fountain and all these buildings around. It definitely still has the classic feel. I mean, they took the guts for the filmmakers to actually go over there and, and film it there, you know, with Mill Damsky. You know, who 
did an excellent job directing this and writer Noah Black who has been known for doing uh, other particular films I mean the movie that he directed was uh, Pretty Poison with Anthony Perkins and Tuesday Wells yeah black comedy and he's done other stuff too um, they work well together um, that's beautiful cinematography by Donovan E. Foreman, um, with editing by old Nicholas Brown. So they they definitely took a notch. It does have a particular. It doesn't feel like an 80s movie at all. It almost feel like this movie would have came out at that period, though. Um, but of course, in the 50s, you know, just when everything had to be crystal clear and crisp clean here you know, homey style I mean of course they're, they're going to have some darker humor in there but I don't think because I know in, in 50's films I don't think we ever heard any uh, foul languages like that too but either way it's overlooked and it's a fresh feel good 50's style teen comedy that's worth your time I know it was worth my time too um Yes, it was on DVD when it was released by Anchor Bay. It's out of print now. I mean, you can pick it up online if you have to. Like on Amazon or, hell, if you're lucky to find it at your local Goodwill or thrift store, that they may have it there. You, there's a chance. So. I really hope it does get a Blu-ray someday. I mean, I know it, ha it may be the musical rights that they have, you know, the copyrights, but as long as they'd be able to obtain them, but I mean, just be lucky it got released at all. Um, but I hope that Kino might take a chance to release this on Blu-ray, seeing that they got a hold of the Disney library that includes Fox. I mean, now that Fox will probably not going to end up releasing the Blu-ray nor 4K release of their own. Yeah, I mean, through Disney. But I think if Kino does release this, I'd be happy. I definitely would love to pick this up. I mean, it might not have features, but I'll probably end up having maybe just a commentary, a feature, maybe a a uh, like a new interview with, with one of the cast who are still alive, at least, if they're interested, and see how this holds. So. Anyway, that's Mischief, and I give the movie... Four and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.